Hi everybody, my name is Eli. I'm Jason. I'm Caden. I'm Jaden. We're at the Yahoo on the Tour YouTube channel. And we thank you guys very, very much for hanging out with us. It is a first day on, uh, if you guys are actually celebrating, it's the first day on the, uh, the week that we are on. We had a Shabbat yesterday and uh, we had a great online Shabbat service for anyone who wants to see it. It's uh, definitely a good service. We are into the book of, uh, please turn those notifications off. Just turn the volume off on that. Turn the volume down. Okay, we are into the, um, uh, deep into the book of uh, the Nazarene. This is uh, the, the one of the enlightened one, and it is, is getting longer. The chapters are getting longer, and there's a lot for us to dissect. And there's a lot of this stuff that we need as gentlemen, that we need to apply to our lives in this, and that we need to see. Okay, do you need to give that over to Eli okay. to do that? Okay, so that is that is what we need to do. When we go through this, we need to go through this very slow. Jaden, okay, Eli, and we need to listen to this because you're going to hear stuff that you've never, ever heard before, ever. And you're going to hear stuff that it needs to be applied to your lives, that need to be applied to our lives, things that we have never, ever heard before that our Messiah has said that is incredible. And so let's begin with this and let's, let's talk about this. Let's discuss this as we find stuff into this and hopefully these uh, dogs will behave. <clears throat> Listen up, boys. Leaving the Sea of Galilee behind them, Yahushua took the disciples up into the mountains and also went, and all others went also. Here there was a house providing warmth and shelter, so they tarried a while, it being the time of preparation for sowing. One cold night, Yahushua went out from the room where they sat at, at food to relieve a man guarding the donkeys, so he might come in and warm himself. Later, when the man returned to his charges, he found Yahushua shivering, for he had placed his cloak around a foal. The man said, Master, why do you do this? But seeing you have done it, why does not our father provide a mantle for his son? Okay, thoughts on this right here um, real quick. So he covered the animal before he covered himself? Yeah, so a guy came back and he was sitting there shaking. He was, he was freezing cold. And his coat, his cloak was around a cold donkey, a cold baby donkey. And um, this is, so the guy asked a question. He's like, number one, why do you do this? And then the second is that now that you've done this, why does not the father provide a mantle for his son? So if he's shivering, if he's the son of Elohim, why isn't the father covering him up? Three, Yahushua said, the little one is helpless in our hands, but we are not helpless in the father's hands. The foal has no choice but to remain in the stall while I can choose to go or stay, to keep my covering or to give it to another. If Yahuwah avoided the effects of our good deeds, what merit would they have? So right there, that sentence, if Yahuwah avoided the effects of our good deeds, what merit would they have? That goes to tell us that every single thing that we do, whether good or whether bad, is recorded. Every foul thing that we say, every bad thought that we have, every action that is very bad, it is going to be chosen. It will be seen. We will have to review all of this, right? And our, the, what Messiah just said is that we are, we're not, as human beings, we're not helpless. We have the ability to fix ourselves. We have the ability to stand up and go inside. But the little donkey, he was stuck in a, in a, a stall. Three. Yahushua said, is it three or four? Well, we are on four, four. No, Yeah, four. The man said, I will pray to Elohim to make me good, even as you. Yahushua said, pray that your deeds merit the reward of goodness. Okay, guys, let's, let's, I want to discuss every one of these things here because this is, this is absolutely huge. We don't know these things before. We have never heard this kind of wisdom that is coming out of Messiah's mouth before. This is, these are these books that have been hidden from us and from the world. And this stuff, it completely makes sense. And this definitely is our Messiah speaking. Now, when somebody says, I prayed Elohim to make me good, even as Messiah... Messiah says, pray that your deeds merit the reward of goodness. Right. Now, your deeds could just be in this house is getting up every single day and taking care of your brother, taking care of your mother, taking care of this, taking care of the works of the house, right? Those are the deeds. Everything that you guys do everywhere are your deeds. And that is the same for everyone out there. When you walk by somebody and you do not help them out and when they need help or if somebody comes to you and you, they need help and you refuse to help them, those are your deeds, whether they be good or whether they be bad. Five, another night, a journeyman came seeking shelter and warmth and was given hospitality. He said to those who made him welcome, you are blessed indeed to live here in warmth and comfort while I must ride the inhospitable roads for my master. The following morning, having been well provided with substance for the road, he said to Yahushua, 
ere he departed. Master, I have listened well to your words last night. Since I am a poor man suffering many hardships, and my life is difficult, am I then assured of better conditions in the life to come? Yahushua said, By what standards do you think these things are judged? Using yours, the pack horse accompanying you should be more entitled to this assurance. For while you ate soup and slept in comfort and warmth, this uncomplaining beast whose lot is much harder than yours remained neglected in the cold. Okay, thoughts? So basically, because you have a hard life doesn't mean you're going to get anything better. Anything, because the animal would deserve more than you. Yeah, you're, 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 yeah. Who, are, who are we to want more than what we have? I mean, we are able to breathe. We're able to live. We're able to uh, celebrate our, our Messiah. We're able to follow the Torah. We're able to do this. We are functioning human beings. And so getting something, you know, for living the life that we're living, don't expect that, right? And so, you know, the, the, the donkey is more rewarded than we would be because it's doing far more work. Towards the end of their stay, a learned man came to eat with them, one knowing all the books of wisdom and the Torah. While talking with the disciples, he said, because of my knowledge, I am a man of no mean position, and many men are silent before me when weighty matters are under discussion. Yahushua overhearing this said, take no credit for yourself concerning your knowledge. But compare yourself to a borrower who has debt to repay. Does the borrower receive credit for repaying what he has borrowed? Therefore, take no credit for the wisdom you dispense. And as to the acquisition of knowledge, is this not the end for which you were created? So basically, he said that you do not need to boast in what you're doing, right? Do not sit there and say how great you are. You owe it all back to Yahuwah. You owe it back to the person that was able to let you read, the person that was able to let you understand. Yeah, we didn't create our eyes, and we did not give ourselves understanding to be able to read and to be able to understand what we are given. And I find it very interesting, his last word on this says, and as to the acquisition of knowledge, is this not the end for which you were created, right? And that is it. We are supposed to get closer to our creator, and as we... As we learn about him, we're supposed to apply this knowledge and, and the Torah to our life. Okay, 10. When this man had departed, Yahushua said to his disciples, The books of wisdom should be the treasure of all men, for they contain the explanations and instructions of Yahuwah. When men say, Woe, because I am smitten with calamity, why does Elohim let disaster strike in this manner? Or why is my, why is my lot in life unlike that of others? Be sure they have not unlocked the door of their treasure house. Okay, um, this, is a, this is a very interesting thing. What do you guys, uh, when he says the books of wisdom, capital book know. and capital I, wisdom. Is that, that like Proverbs or that's the I just know it's Proverbs. I'm, that's probably like the scroll. It tells like... us. It tells us in the next line. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah, well, it says right here. It says the treasures of all men. We already read it. For they contain the explanations and instructions of Yahuwah. So what? I don't think I've ever read those books. You've that'd never be, read the be, instructions the of Torah. Yahuwah? Oh, well, okay, yeah, I've read that. <laughs> that's the Torah. Yeah. Right, you get it? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's the only thing it can be, right? We have read that. We've read it over and over and over. We don't have any other explanations and instructions of Yahuwah other than the Torah. We don't get that in, uh, say, Daniel, right? You get little bits and pieces of it. You don't get any of the full explanation. The, the, the book of wisdom is the Torah. Okay, 11. By reading the books of wisdom, you will be brought to an understanding of the nature and intention of Elohim, and life will then have meaning and purpose. Without them, you can be likened to a man at sea in a fair wind, but lacking sail and oars. Reading them, but lacking guidance or understanding, you'd be likened to a man at sea with sail and oars, but without the ability to utilize them. Guys, this is talking about people, could be like us, who are somewhat learned in the Torah, who know what is going on, right? It says that people, it doesn't matter how much instruction you have, if you're not using it properly, then you're out in the middle of the water where you have no sailing, you have no oars, and you're going to be driven around. It's going to be driven into a circle. This is clearly talking about the, the guy that came to them had extreme knowledge in the Torah. And because of his extreme knowledge in the Torah, um, Messiah talks a lot about this, right? And if you do not use this you're, and you don't use it correct, correctly, then you're, you're, you're forsaking the purpose of the Torah. 12. A disciple, one who has been with Yochanan, asked, Master, tell us which is true. Yochanan taught the way of the wilderness and said, Be the best of men, and let Elohim take care of his kingdom, for you are the rulers of the earth. Yet at other times he told us to await the coming of one who would deliver us from the evils of this world and show us the path of righteousness. Yahushua said, If you knew a distinguished guest was coming, would you not make fitting preparations, doing all things to ensure an appropriate welcome? 
If a man has many servants, does he thrash his own grain? The road indicated by Yochanan is not my road, but it leads to the same destination. I bring you the way of the cross, which is the cross of life. Follow what I teach, and you will be with me at the end. Choose your path, for no man can plow two furrows, neither can the hands of two men hold the reins. Anyone want to take a stab at this? So he said that, like, if you know, like, the Messiah is coming, right? Wouldn't you want to make, like, a warm welcome for him? Wouldn't you want to make it well for him? And then he says that, basically, the road that is to come is the same destination. Basically, you, the rulers of the earth are going to be the same place where Messiah Yahushua is going to end up. Yep, and you can, you're not going to be able to join a Christian church because that is a plow of its own, right? You will be plowing furrows that are not yours, that are in rocky ground, that don't make a lot of sense, right? The Messiah says he, he brings you the way of the cross, and the cross is life. And um, you can't serve our creator and be part of man. When you... When you are joined into a Christian church and you say that you are a Christian or a Catholic or a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or anything of that sort, anything of the sort, you are plowing a field that is not contained the Torah. When you avoid the Torah, when you take, when you are putting it on the cross, you will never plow with that. And if you do not plow with that, you won't have it. And if you have a spiritual leader that is trying to help you plow the field, your hands are going to be on two different furrows and it's not going to work out. And so we have to choose who we're going to serve. 15. While Yahushua was still in the, in the mountains preparing his disciples for the task ahead, two wandering musicians came by and one was always laughing and the other always melancholy. Yahushua said to them, many men have differing skills and are you not skilled with a lute and lyre? They said, this is so. Yahushua said, now when the strings of your instruments are too taut, what happens? They replied, then there's discord. And Yahushua said, it is it not even so if the strings are too slack? They replied, it is. Yahushua said, sometimes the natures of men need slackening, for they are too taut, while sometimes they are too slack. Be like your instruments, always tuned to the right note, and let there be harmony between you. Now, do you guys think you have harmony in this house between your brotherhoods, between uh, these brothers? Sometimes. Sometimes. For the most part, on a day-to-day -day basis, is there harmony within the brotherhood? Is there silence? Does nobody want to say anything? Eli? Mm, no, there's not harmony. There's no. not harmony in the brotherhood. Time, time, no. Yeah, not, most of the time with brothers, there is not harmony in this house. That is something we, we don't have. So what he's talking about here is he's talking about if your strings are too loose or they're too tight, the notes don't come out right. And Jade, you're a guitar player, right? Kind of. Kind of? Well, tell us about this. Tell us what happens if your strings are too tight or too loose. It doesn't sound right. And so what do you do if it doesn't sound right? Uh, you got to figure out if it's too loose or too tight, you got to tune it. You got to tune it, right? And you got to tune it. And if you don't tune your guitar and you try to play music, what does it sound like? Uh, it sounds bad. So if you guys try to walk this world without harmony, without the Torah, what do you look like? Bad. Bad. It, it sounds bad, right? Just like this. This is this is this. And you know, for everybody out there, I'm not just tossing this family under the bus. This is for everybody out there. This is something that I can relate to, that we can all relate to here. But this can be the same for everybody out there. Do you live in harmony with your neighbors? Do you live in harmony with your wife? Do you live in harmony? Is there a harmony? Because where there is not harmony, there's a clanking sound, and pretty soon it gets very annoying, it gets very vile, and you don't want to sit there and listen to it. Unharmetic world and, and, and a world of unharmony within emotions is a very, very bad place to be, and it, it gets old very quick. One of the disciples said to Yahushua, Master, you tell us many things, and I cannot retain all your words. Surely some are better than others. What should I store in my heart? Yahushua said, A king had two castles, one at each end of a wall, guarding his kingdom. And he gave each of his two sons command over a castle. When word came that an enemy approached, he ordered his sons to collect all kinds of provender and store it. One son collected everything he could, but the other took only what he considered the best, leaving everything else. The enemy came, and both castles were besieged. The castle of one son fell when his supplies were exhausted, but the other held out utilizing what had the other had rejected. So it is my words, even those, those which may seem least of value, one day prove their worth. I think I read that wrong. Even those which may seem of least value may one day prove their worth. What does he mean by this? 
He means that even if like someone looks to be a failure, someone looks to be not good in life, they they will prove themselves eventually. Eventually, it will prove that they are worthy. So he's talking. He's talking about what his words are. He's talking about his words. The guy. The question was. Which of your words? I am. I'm a slow man, or I can't grasp everything and that you say. Says you should hold up everything you can because this guy stored all he needed for his castle, and they were able to defend off the attackers. Yeah, because they stored up everything they needed, but the other guy didn't. He just threw stuff out. Yep, and so the the whole point of that had nothing to do with what you were talking about, kid. The whole point of this is that we can be um, ready. We can be prepared. We can either be spiritually prepared, or we can be not spiritually prepared. If we do not have the Torah, we are unspiritually prepared. And a lot of people are, would say, well, what in the Torah is worth its worth? There's a lot of words in there. And just like Messiah says, it doesn't matter. Even the least of these words, depending on the situation, will have value. And that, and that is very, very true. These are amazing things that our Messiah is saying. The disciple then said, tell us where we may find Yahuwah in truth. Yahushua said, you have the holy books and my words. Turning to the others, he said, This man is like a beggar who all his life stood under a fig tree. More than everything, anything else, he desired to be rich, but he remained always poor and dressed in rags, like all men. He came to his hour, and those who buried him dug his grave at the place where he had spent his life. When the earth under the tree was opened up, it exposed a treasure of great prize, gold and jewels, right under the spot where he had been begging. How easy it would have been for that man to be rich. One of those to whom Yahushua spoke said, then all we have to do is read and listen, assimilating the knowledge gained? Yahushua said, there is danger even in this. Consider a snake catcher who go, going among the rocks sees a snake well worth catching, but in his haste grabs it by the tail instead of behind the head. So it turns and bites him, causing his death. Did he die because of his calling or because he grabbed the snake wrongly? Was he not wrong in his approach rather than what he did? It is even so with those who know the holy books from end to end, but handle them wrongly. Yahushua said, be humble in your knowledge and not puffed up, but be aware of the snare of false humility. Guys, these are huge things. This is why he absolutely, they absolutely killed him, right? This is, these are the things that he said that caused a ton of issues within this. And this again, it talks about those who know the holy books from end to end, but they do not apply them to their lives, right? Yeah. Okay, so that could be anybody out there, right? If you know what is in these books, but you're not applying them, you're, you're failing yourself. Yahushua said, be humble in your knowledge, not puffed up, but be aware the snare of false humility. One said to him, master, what is false humility? Yahushua said, a man was once told if he could learn humility, he would become perfect. And desiring perfection in himself, above all, he diligently studied everything relating to humility. There was, there was nothing about it he did not know. However, one day a man asked him, What is your humility gained for you? Where, have you? where have you benefited? To which the supposedly humble man replied, Stupid one, what is the matter with you? For can you not see that having learned humility, I am now a perfect man? About this time, Yahushua came upon two disciples, arguing as to which of his teachings could be, should be retained in their hearts. Yahushua said, your argument can be likened to two wives, one old and one young. The old one kept pulling out the dark hairs on her husband's head, while the young one kept pulling out the white hairs. So he became bald, having no hair at all. Then both women said, behold, we have a bald-headed husband. Okay. I don't think I get that one. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what he's saying with this, right? So the disciples were arguing as to the teachings, which teaching of Messiah should be retained in your heart. And... Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how, how this goes down, but it would be, um, you have a, uh, you know, a wife. I don't know why the one wife would be pulling out your dark hairs and the other wife would be pulling, it seems like uh, the other one would be that Because she's an old one, so Maybe. she's trying to uh, keep him like her. Right, and then the other one's like that. Yeah, so, um, I, you know, anyone find uh, thoughts on this? I, I mean, think he's saying, uh, like, they're like, all of them are good, don't like pick and choose. Don't pick and choose. If not, you'll have you'll end up with nothing. You'll end up bald with nothing. Yeah, I think I think you're right, Kate. I think that is right, and um, because the, you're you're exactly right, um, because the argument was about which of his teachings should be retained in their hearts, and if you're pulling out hairs and you don't retain anything, then you're bald and you have nothing at all. 
All right, guys, I think this is it. I think we're going to leave it at this. I don't want to make these too long, so we're going to do these chapters in <laughs> halves. Oh, yeah. This is half, so this is half of this chapter. is another 25 verses, and I don't want to get too long because I want to keep the people who have time for a daily devotion kind of this and kind of reading. So, guys, um, as you can see from this reading, this is the words of Messiah. This is a very exciting, very exciting lesson. This is a very exciting reading. We've never, ever, ever had the words of our Messiah quite like this. We have, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, you know, other, other books, but we have never heard wisdom come from anything like this. And the question is, why did it get removed from our scriptures? Why do we have to search and why do we have to seek and try to find things of this nature? You know, why do we end up with a 66 book version of scriptures while all the other good books have been ripped out? Anyway, that's what we're trying to bring back. And so we hope you guys found something with this. We hope you have a wonderful day. We love you all very, very much. And we are out. All right, shalom. shalom.